Hope everybody's doing well on this uh, during this global attack on human consciousness. See many more people slowly waking up, which is awesome. Starting to see through uh, all the all the lies and deception and manipulation going on all around us. It's a beautiful thing. Anyways, I got a couple of stories here. Um, I'm actually gonna I'm gonna share a story from uh, somebody that sent me in. Uh, it was an email just a while back, and uh, it's a good story. And then I'm just going to share a couple of other things, you know, that I've spoken about um, doing interviews and stuff. But I'm I'm going to uh, relay this here and tell you about a couple other interesting things that have happened to me um, that were, uh, uh, in my opinion, that's directly related to Sasquatch uh, existence, not to do with Sasquatch, but something uh, connected to it. And part of the reason why I see this as one big massive cover-up. So anyways, we'll start with this one. And I'll leave names out because that's what they asked me to do. So uh, uh, my name is so-and-so and I'm 63 years of age. I live in the small, small rural community of, I'm gonna leave that out too, that's, uh, I don't know, about maybe three and a half hours northeast of Toronto, roughly in that region, uh, Ontario. And I'm, uh, I've been a professional soldier, a laborer, and a long haul truck driver over the very productive years of my life. And, and yeah, it's funny how things are not as they appear. I learned that. I learned it early at 13 years of age. And here's how. Uh, my parents, uh, my uncle and his wife, uh, my brother, my brother and I, we all went camping uh, on a camping trip up to Algonquin Park in June of 1973. Uh, I just want to say too, it's, it's amazing the details that, that people um, recall from decades old experience because it's ingrained in your psyche, you know, never to be forgotten in your entire life. Um, so we went up to Algonquin in, the, in June of 1973. We always camped during our holidays, usually at the, end of co uh, at the cottage of my father's childhood friend, um, or usually at the cottage of my, child, uh, my father's childhood friend up in the Clear Lake, uh, Lake Clear in the Eganville area. Uh, this trip was special though. We had planned to boat into the interior of the park, hauling enough of the daily acquirements necessary to live comfortably for uh, two entire weeks. An expedition is how we viewed it. Uh, now we grew up in Toronto and moved to the farm when I was 10. We had horses, we had dogs, cats, chickens, laters, uh, cows, sheep and even pigs. I was, I, I am perfectly comfortable around large animals. We arrived after much planning and a good deal of profanity. Try getting all that gear into the trunk of a convertible and a 71 F-150. At the boat launch, uh, located at the south end of Opiongo Lake in Algonquin Park. Uh, at that time, early in the mid-morning, it was already quite busy at the launch, so my uncle and my father checked in at the park station to inquire about the rate and how we'd uh, go about getting a site for the two-week period we had planned to be there. The park staff told us to cruise up the lake. The spots were clearly marked. Uh, just select one to our liking and uh, let them know later in the day exactly where we were. So we launched the boat, got all of us on board with only half our gear, heading north on the lake, uh, skirting the eastern shoreline as the wind out of the northwest had whipped up a good deal of chop in the open water. Two hours north we traveled, finding a beautiful secluded spot in a small point of land that was completely uninhabited. We swung the bow rider sideways against a downed tree, root ball still attached, that had fallen parallel to the shore. It was a very convenient dock for the for the weeks we were there. Um, after unloading the boat, uh, it was agreed that mom, uh, so-and-so and my brother and I would remain at the site with the gear while my dad and my uncle returned to the launch for the remainder of the supplies and to let the parks people know where we, where we could be found should they be looking. They left and we settled in for a short wait, uh, four or five hours. The site was uh, old growth, coniferous, well-spaced and airy, backing onto the uh, very 
heavy deciduous and weedy growth, very green and very lush. I spent a while exploring the area, a uh, little brother in tow, he was just turning 11, next, uh, next month I'd be 13. The forest floor within the site was thick and soft with old brown pine needle. Uh, Mom and and uh, so and so spent their time in the sun on the shoreline on some big rocks that were embedded at the water's edge. My brother and I eventually joined them, sitting astride the locks, uh, sitting astride the logs we were utilizing as a dock, facing one, <coughs> excuse me, facing one another about six feet apart. That was when the first rock arced gracefully from the area of the campsite. We all saw it. It landed just past the log we were astride, hitting the water with a loud plunk. We all heard it as well. Uh, Mom and I exchanged puzzled looks. Uh, little brother said, did you guys see that? And the second rock, about the size of a potato, in near slow motion and trailing small clumps of dirt, finds its way between us all, impacting the water in exactly the same place. Plunk. Um, I did some quick calculations. I played center field for a local softball team at the time and was satisfied the rock came from a, a ways away. So I jumped up off the log in about six long running steps in spite of my mom trying to stop me by yelling, it's a bear, it's a bear. I found myself past the reedy shore growth that obscured the shady cool of the campsite as little brother stayed put. At first I saw nothing uh, unusual, nothing unusual, nothing obvious. Then about 40 feet away, maybe closer, I see black fur on either side of a silver birch tree, very low to the ground and moving in spasms like it's clawing at the ground back there. Crap, I think. Uh, my mom was right. It's a wee black bear. And then suddenly it stops moving. Two hands rise up and cup the two sides of the V in the tree and a face appears between the trunks of the tree. That, uh, that, the being locked eyes with me and I was for a moment dizzy scared the fear of uncertainty, I think, uh, of not knowing what you're seeing, not understanding the information being processed by your eyes, uh, feeling suddenly very, very exposed. Don't ask me why, Mike, but I felt the being I was seeing was a female. I saw nothing to confirm this, just a strong impression that the being was a young female that just got caught with her hand in the cookie jar. Uh, she was just as frightened as I was. If I read the face and eyes correctly and I relaxed and asked, well, what on earth are you? We were stalemated in a stare. The fear went away as the realization came that this was a kid. She was not much taller than me, not significantly heavy, heavier either. She looked quite ape-like, although not at the same time, if that makes any sense. She had light gray, uh, gray skin, light gray hands and feet, and don't laugh, absolutely hands down, the most beautiful black hair I had ever seen. So black. And if that were not strange enough, as she began looking for a safe escape route, first to her right and then to her left. I had two perfect profiles to consider for several seconds each, and her hair on her head appeared purposely groomed into its shape. It, I dislike calling the being it, uh, decided that an exit stage left was in order, and it hopped like a rabbit traverses the ground at leisure. Front feet out, back feet collected to the hands, front feet out, back feet collected to the hands. Three hops like this, and then it turned, Again, hard left so that I could see her back while rising up onto two feet and she began running. Not just running, Mike, running at a speed I can't even relate to you. Blazing, although comical, as she ran with her back bolt straight and her knees high. And honest to God, it looked like the Saturday morning comic Scooby-Doo where the legs are a blur milling frantically as the body slowly builds momentum. Okay, not strange enough? Let me help you with that, Mike. She faded completely from sight before she hit the tree line, disappeared. So another one disappeared in thin air. Uh, there was no being visible when the lush underbrush exploded with the force of something running through its thick cover. I did not blink. I saw that. Now I say she because that was the impression I got from her. I saw nothing indicating um, either way, just a feeling. Uh, fear? Initially, yes, an unsettled what the heck do I do now kind of fear. There was no exchange of... Uh, nicety, no information shared other than my verbalized question to her. And I seem to remember saying, my name is, I'm not gonna say his name, <laughs> say Jack. And uh, what's yours? Like there was going to be an answer. Laugh out loud. I go back to my seat on the log, head spinning, mind reeling, feeling like, like many have related, as if the whole event happened in a complete vacuum. And mom asked me, 
Did you find what was throwing the stones? Was it a bear? No, it wasn't a bear. Then what was it? A monkey, Ma. It was a monkey. Explosive laughter all around. Good one. Yeah, funny. Tell your dad that one when he gets back. I just sat there. So there it is, except there's more. Recently things have gotten a little um, strange, shall we say. My parents own a tract of land directly to the east of where they live, or where, um, yeah, the three and a half hours northeast of Toronto. It runs from the end of uh, um, the said street or drive to the cemetery, about a kilometer in length parallel to the, to the Trent River. That gives you an idea, roughly. And an old growth deciduous forest consisting mainly of ash, poplar, oak, and maple with some black walnut tossed in to round things out. I played there as a child. We all played there as children, our friends and us. Okay, so uh, my house is in town. From my front window, I can see my folks' house up on the hill. In my yard, there's an apple tree, a delicious species, species of apple that drops a fantastic harvest every second year, far beyond the look of the tree. Um, I pick them up and transport them to the farm and fibers, depositing them with my folks' permission up along the top of the east field where dad can watch the deer, the, the deer, deer enjoy the treat. Uh, there's no hunting allowed on that farm, in that forest, none, not ever. I pulled into my parents' driveway a month or so ago and much to my surprise, there at eye level on top of the fence post that lines up with, the pass, uh, with my passenger window was a perfect unbruised and polished delicious apple. I thought my mother had, uh, had been for a walk, which is good, to the top of the field, had retrieved an apple and had placed it on the fence post. Except for the fact that my, uh, my downers are bruised, squirrel sampled, horn had eaten fruit that is far from perfect, picked is how it looked. Mom says to me seconds after I get settled in my chair, oh, I saw that apple you placed on the fence. When did you do that? It wasn't there when we went out to the gas station last night, but it was there when we returned home. I said, I never did. I thought it was you. Must have been a squirrel, she says. Next day, I take my lab up to the farm for a visit, forgetting uh, my father has a cancer treatment shot in, in remission that morning. So I let the dog run around the yard as I spark up a cigarette and kick about the driveway up at the corner of the field, uh, east slash northeast of my position at about 125 meters, a corner significantly overgrown explodes with bird sound. No bird I'm familiar with either. Uh, not turkey, not a songbird, not the starlings, crow robin, or anything I could identify. And it was shockingly loud. There appeared to be a flock involved. And I could see uh, nothing on the limbs and branches that were thinning in fall colors. Nothing. Interesting, I think. A little nervous, I left with my dog. That afternoon, I saw my folks drive by on their way home, so I take the dog back up the hill and I find them uh, getting things out of the trunk of their vehicle in the driveway. I get out of my truck uh, to a worried, worried looking mother. Someone has been looking in my living room window, she says. Look at my garden, all flattened down. It was, uh, quite a lot. I tell her, I don't think so. We had heavy rain last night, that was it. Heavy rain. I, re I returned home and stood on my front porch, wondering out loud. I thought maybe something or someone was listening. Uh, about the gift of the apple. Next morning, I noted a divot by the silver maple tree in the middle of the yard. I could see it plainly from the recliner that I'm seated in to write this uh, to you. Damn. Skunks rooting for late grubs, maybe? Raccoon digging at something? I could see no piled dirt, uh, no divot laying exposed on the cut grass. Gotta fix that, I think. Uh, I finished my coffee and carried on with my morning routine. Later that day, I went out to fix the hole. I looked at it, and then again, and then again, returned to the house and exchanged my garden tools for a tape measure. The footprint, and I know damn well it was a footprint, as the crushed grass lining on the bottom of it proved the fact that no, tur uh, that no turf or soil, in fact, had been removed from the one and a half inch deep, perfectly formed left footprint. I put my size nine sneaker into the print. Um, it was longer and wider, 13 inches long, seven and a half inches wide below the toes, uh, yes, toes, and five inches wide at the heel. That's pretty fat. Um, that's very fat. I look up to see my neighbor studying me from her front window, not wanting to appear crazy. I stop measuring, nonchalantly strolling around the tree, inspecting the foliage. So next day, I walk out back of the farmhouse behind the barn to a location overlooking the steep ravine um, slash valley that leads uh, back to the Trent. And um, 
Thank you for the print. Please do not frighten my parents. Now that I know you're here and that you're aware that I know, uh, where do you want to take this? I got a couple of the loudest raven calls in reply down in the ravine about a hundred meters out and loud. This was followed by a um, distinct knock and a very, very crisp and loud break from the top of the ravine, ravine directly across from me. And that's exactly what they do. And um, I just want to mention something as well that uh, well, during one visit um, with Duane his cottage, it was middle of winter, you know, thick, thick ice on the lake. And it was, it was late at night and I heard the loudest ever perfect loon call. There's no loons around that time of year. There isn't, there's none. And it was so loud, it just, it, you know, I didn't have my audio running at the time. It was pretty mind blowing. Um, okay then, the neighbor across the road down toward town has sheep, llama or, pal or alpaca. I can never tell the difference. And three uh, very large um, dogs. Uh, my last pup was, uh, uh, was a Pyrenees. I know their bark, that deep gruff bark my wife, my wife and I sitting outside one night hear the dogs having a conniption fit over something. They're about 300 meters up in the field. It's dark. We discuss the possibilities. Next morning, I'm headed up for uh, my morning visit with the folks when, I, when I, I notice every, and I mean everything around me, particularly my daily route. I see across the road from, um, uh, I guess, a neighbor's place, a twin trunk tree, you know, forked at the ground level packed in the V with uh, quite large branches, uh, packed in the V with quite large branches, about a dozen of them. The ends of the branches do not touch the ground as they're caref carefully balanced in the crotch. There are several other examples of trees growing in this manner right there beside this one. Yet none of them have a, uh, none of has become a catch basin for felled branch and all are co-located across from the farmhouse, some 40 meters from the front door. Sigh. So what do I do? I've uh, taken up so much of your time, Mike. I apologize. No apology uh, needed, of course. Um, advice would uh, not only uh, would be not only taken; it would be most welcome. Not sure I'm entirely entirely there with you just yet about the purpose of the control methods we endure, but I am certain in my soul that you're gen genuinely engaged with these beings and and are being slowly educated by them. Hence uh, this uh, missive, you are officially the second person I have told this to. Uh, the first, however, to get the entire beta on the event, strangeness and all. I do not trust any organization regarding these beings, Mike. Right on. Thank you very much because uh, none of them are out for real truth in this. That's, uh, you know, BFRO, Ontario, whatever any of these organizations they don't have a clue what they're doing um they're not at a cottage uh, they're not a cottage industry and neither are they animal those who exploit this also harbor agendas that is not in the best interest of you or them my mom uh, aunt and uncle by the way still remember the monkey at algonquin and i recently made sure they knew i was telling the truth they believe me uh, regards to uh, neff Take care of yourself, Mike, and um, please remaining anonymous is my wish. Text you may reference if you wish. Uh, for now, my name and family name are in your care, so please do not divulge them to anyone. And I, I never do. I always respect people's privacy that way. And you know, I've had a lot of people confide in me their experiences, and you know, I great greatly appreciate that, as I'm sure many of you do as well. Um, so the yeah the the strange um the bird sounds and that was very interesting because it's something i've experienced as well and and i actually relayed a uh, an older story too to somebody this morning on a on a video post i'd made a comment about um at one point uh, Dwayne and i we'd pulled up on a snowmobile you know up near his cottage and we cut the engine and there was nobody around uh you know at the time we were we were doing this there's definitely no uh, snowmobiles in the area and the motor was cut, and so it was quiet. And suddenly we, we heard two revs from a snowmobile engine nearby. It was like close, and there was no motor running, and that was it. So, you know, how, how that happens, I have no idea, but it's definitely, um, I'm very confident it's related to the Sasquatch presence. Um, and so is this.
So this was back in, oh geez, when was it? July, um, shit, sorry. Shoved my glass in my front pocket, didn't even realize right one. Um, so I had, uh, let's see, I have this still pulled up here. Um, I took a picture because I had, I had written these down. So I have the date. Um, so July 4th, 2018. So, and then I had another one happen 15 days later. So I had two, two UFO incidents and they were given to me purposely. How do I know that? Um, excuse me, excuse my sniffing here. Um, so July 4th, 2018 is about 12.30 in the afternoon and I was driving north on the 400 series highway. So I had Pearson Airport to my left. And, uh, you know, the shadows vehicles were basically almost directly under the, under the vehicle at that time. It was, and I, I took notice that it was a cloudless day. If there was anything, it was extremely high up in the atmosphere. There was zero uh, low clouds. It was like extremely clear day, a very sunny, clear, beautiful day. So July 4th, 2018, and I'm driving north. I'm doing probably, you know, just a little over the speed limit um, with the flow of traffic. And there was a, uh, you know, there's a lot of lanes there. So I was probably about five, maybe six lanes over from the left. And to my immediate left lane was a transport just ahead a bit. And behind that, I think there was another vehicle. And so I'm driving um, with the flow of traffic and suddenly this large shadow passes over top of me and it's moving just slightly faster than the traffic and right away I, I don't know I get this strange feeling and I connected with it instantly and I watched this shadow it only took a few seconds I watched this shadow envelop this whole truck as it as it moved forward just going a little faster than traffic and and right away I noticed there's no sound going on and I stuck my head out the window and there was there was nothing there and there had to be something there it was basically impossible you know by our current understanding of reality unless it was a cloaked ship and that's the only thing that makes sense to me and i actually found something else on uh, you know uh, somebody else experiencing something similar that was sent to me uh, you know, somebody had sent me that um, story somebody else uh, you know same kind of experience right so this was per put purposely directly in front of me, lasted only a few seconds, but enough for me to catch on to it. Did I see a ship? No, I didn't see a ship, it, but it was right there. It had to be there. You know, there had to be something right there to give off that moving shadow as it did. And there was nothing there. So 15 days later, um, so that was pristine conditions and the, whatever, whoever would have known, you know, the conditions were perfect for this, right? So 15 days later, I was up in Neff's area, I was alone, I was by myself, and again, it was pristine conditions. Um, so this was, uh, I think it happened about 11.30 at night. I did a quick read on it um, before I come up here just to get the date and times. The other one I knew happened about 12.30, I remembered that. Um, but the one at night, yeah, so that was about 11.30 at night. And I was by myself. I was in this spot where I pitch my tent when I'm not visiting uh, uh, Dwayne's Cottage with him. And again, uh, the cloudless sky, and it was dead still. And there's a lot of nights up there like that where it's just dead still. You can literally hear a pin drop on the ground. Um, so I'm sitting, you know, I, I come out of the woods, and I... Uh, you know, plop a chair down on, on a gravel road there and I'm watching watching the skyline and I can see way off in the distance I can I can see planes, right? Um, you know, going across the going across the sky, way way over way out there and I can um, see their flashing lights, no problem, and I can hear their engines uh, engine sound, you know, after the plane passes and then the en engine sound catches up afterwards. Not a problem. I can hear it loud and clear and it's way off there. And suddenly I see a a light like a like a big uh, jet pointed directly at me and it's out there too, but uh, you know, as far as those other ones were. And I instantly noticed there was no flashing lights on this. And I found it very odd that, uh, you know, suddenly I see this light and it's like 
this bright light off in the distance, no flashing lights, and I stand up, and I sit, I stand there, and I'm, I'm watching this thing, and it came towards me, and it got closer and closer, and, and it ended up passing right over top of the road where I was at, you know, not far from me, and I, it was, you know, it's a little difficult to estimate the, um, the altitude, perfect altitude, uh, you know, whatever the altitude was, but it, it seemed to be a couple thousand feet up in the air. I've done a little bit of skydiving, so, um, you know, I can kind of measure a little bit of that. It seemed a couple thousand feet, roughly. So it passed over the top of the road, uh, just down the road from me a little bit, and I didn't see any craft because it was just this big, bright light, and it had not a sound. It was dead quiet, so it was no drone. You know, there's, from my understanding, we don't have any drones flying around that uh, isn't going to make some noise. And like I said, it's so quiet up there sometimes. It's very easy to, to hear distant sounds. Um, and this thing passed over top of the road. So that was 15 days later. Again, this was put directly in front of me. One during the day, one at night, about two weeks apart. And um, one in Neff's area. And one basically at the top end of the city of Toronto. Um, and what's what's funny is probably you know nobody around me driving in their vehicles had a clue what was going on um, but i caught on like instantly basically uh, you know i get this uh weird uh, wtf w moments going on and um and then i understand like almost instantly what's you know what's happening so so yes i've had two uh, ufo encounter incidents uh, no craft witnessed. Like I said, one was cloaked and one was um, one was a bright light. It was so bright I couldn't, you know, I couldn't see anything. So uh, there's been cases I can't, uh, you know, pull anything off the top of my head. But there's been cases I've read in the past of uh, Sasquatch being seen coming and going from UFOs, and um, you know, anybody involved in with any interest in that subject knows we've been lied to for decades by by government and military about the existence of this stuff and and now you know that has been proven because now they're saying oh yeah they're real you know and trying to control the flow of information as they always do um you know manipulating however they choose to manipulate and uh, the same goes with the subject of Sasquatch. This has also been covered up because, you know, with the amount of sightings, the amount of evidence, and mainstream science still basically in denial or whatever. Nope, nope, not going there. It's, uh, um, sooner or later, you know, they're going to be forced to. They, they don't have a choice because we're there. There's too many people experiencing this stuff. Uh, you know, they can put on these whatever cookie-cutter shows like Finding Bigfoot and try to keep this, um, ape theory alive which I just laugh at it's just ridiculous at this point although a lot of people still hold on to that you know they're, they're, what we're dealing with you know you got to keep an open mind because uh, this whole Sasquatch thing they are much more than that they're very intelligent um, my my uh, understanding at this point these are our true ancestors they are uh, from what I've basically been told um, they're the orig original indigenous people of Earth, and you know they still exist, and they are masters of energy, and they are in the midst of exposing their people to the human race at this time. You know I can see why too. The damage we're doing to the Earth, just it's r insane what we're doing. You know slashing down old growth forests and destroying ecosystems and poisoning absolutely everything. Um, you know, and there's a attack on human consciousness and all this and. So I can see why they're doing this. They want us to wake up and they want us to connect back to nature because, you know, we've kind of veered off into this uh, path of technology, which obviously isn't working too well, is it? You know, not the way things are going. So anyways, I just wanted to share those experiences with you. Hope you enjoyed that. And uh, we'll talk again soon.